The Hero of Winds has his fair share of powerful items. The Power Bracelet, golden jewellery that grants him Herculean strength, allowing him to lift and carry tons of stone. The Light Arrows, piercing bolts of pure sacred energy that instantly annihilate any enemy struck with them, extinguishing their life force with holy might. And the Master Sword, the Blade of Evil's Bane, the legendary sword that seals the darkness, a weapon designed to exterminate evil and split apart Gerudo skulls. But while there's loads of items in the Wind Waker that grant Link's strength, there's one underrated item that grants him incredible defense. Defense that even the might of Ganondorf, the King of Evil, can't break. The Magic Armor. The magic armor is given to Link by Zunari, the mysterious salesman living on Windfall Island. A weird little man who wears his heavy coat even in the mild climate of Windfall Island. He apparently comes from a land where the blizzards blow violently, across cursed seas though we never learn anything more about his origins, aside from that he cares deeply for his mother who made him his thick coat. Zunari dreams of opening a store on Windfall Island, though the only item he has in stock is the small sail with which he braved the cursed seas and travelled to the island. Link buys this sail, which gives him the rupees he needs to start up his business. Zunari is central to one of the Wind Waker's biggest side quests, the island trading sequence. Using the town flower he gives you, you can trade up between various travelling Gorons across the Great Sea until you eventually obtain the Shop Guru statue. For every trade, the Gorons will form a Merchant's Oath, stocking their items at Zunari's store. At the end of this quest, when you've raised up Zunari's little shop from nothing into a busy little store, he'll reward you with his family treasure, the only item he bought with him from his home, aside from the sail in his coat, the Magic Armour. This armour doesn't look like armour at all. It's a purple ball with strange black markings encased in a purple crystal. But while it doesn't look like it could protect you from much more than a paper cut, this armour is actually by far the strongest armour we've ever seen in the Zelda series. More powerful than the red mail from A Link to the Past, than the ancient armour from Breath of the Wild, this magic armour completely protects Link from any and all damage he would otherwise take. When you equip and activate the item, a purple aura-like barrier is projected around Link, which absorbs all damage. He can still be knocked back by enemies like usual, but he won't take any damage whatsoever. In the original game, the magic armor runs on magic power. As long as you're wearing it, you'll be draining the magic meter, making this item pretty much useless except for putting it on if you're close to death to clutch out a fight against a boss or something. But Nintendo redesigned this armor in the HD remake, Instead of magic power, the armor now requires rupees in order to protect Link. And even better, it doesn't require any fuel whatsoever when Link isn't being hit. You can wear it whenever you want, and rupees will only be drained when you're hit. Dark Nuts, Moblins, even Ganondorf will just knock Link over when he's wearing this armor. They can't hurt you at all, just take your rupees away. I'll count this second rupee draining variant of the magic armor as canon, since there must be a reason for the change. It's such an odd little thing to alter in the most recent release of the game. So what actually is Wind Waker's magic armor? Who created this powerful artifact, and why? So aside from Zunari mentioning that it's his prized possession, a family treasure, the origins of this armor are unknown. But straight off the bat, it's incredibly similar to another form of armour in the series, Nehru's love from Ocarina of Time. The comparisons are obvious, both are small, dark coloured orbs surrounded by a coloured crystal. Nehru's love also functions almost identically to the magic armour. It protects Link from any damage, but he'll still be knocked back. Upon activating Nehru's love, Link is protected for exactly one minute at the cost of magic power. Nehru's love is gifted to Link by the Great Fairy of the Desert Colossus. Hyrule Encyclopedia describes it as a spell which creates a barrier when used, temporarily blocking all enemy attacks, named after Nehru, the Goddess of Wisdom, and obtained from a Great Fairy. So here we've got two very similar items from two separate games. One is a spell given to you by a Great Fairy which uses magic power to protect Link. The other is an armour, given to you by a man from a mysterious far off land, which uses rupees to protect Link. Let's actually look at rupees for a second. 
Rupees are obviously the currency from the Zelda series, used across every single game. They usually range from the measly green rupee, worth 1, all the way up to the gold rupee, worth 300, though the colours and values of rupees have changed drastically between the games. Usually though they're just used for trade, buying stock from shopkeepers or paying for services. But they're not always just currency. We know that in some way they're connected to magic, and especially the magic of great fairies. In A Link to the Past, the Fairy Queen will reward Link with a larger quiver or bomb bag depending on how many rupees he donates to her. But most notably, in Breath of the Wild, we see that great fairies have withered and started hibernating. This is because no travellers visit their fountains anymore to donate rupees due to the apocalyptic state of the kingdom, meaning they've lost their powers. Link can replenish the fairies' magic by giving them increasing amounts of rupees, which brings them back to their full... um... beauty. So there you have it, the magic of great fairies is somehow directly connected with rupees. They're not just gems, they contain some form of intrinsic magic which great fairies require to perform their spells, and in extreme cases when great fairies can't obtain these gemstones, their powers fail them. Following this, it makes sense now that the magic armour in the Wind Waker requires rupees to function. Like Nehru's Love, a protective spell given to you by a great fairy in Ocarina of Time, the magic armour in the Wind Waker is powered by the magic of a great fairy, needing rupees to protect Link. Even its purple colour supports this. We've seen gifts from great fairies such as the Great Fairy Sword from Majora's Mask feature this same purple colour alongside black markings. Further strengthening this idea, as a little hint perhaps from the developers, the fishman who tells you about Zunari and the magic armour can be located just off the coast of North Fairy Isle in the Wind Waker's Great Sea. But it's not the only magic armour found in the series. Yeah, in Twilight Princess 2, magic armour can be obtained after a shopkeeper's side quest, this time helping Mallow open a Mallow Mart in Castletown. So Twilight Princess's magic armour looks drastically different to the Wind Waker's because it's, well, actually armour. It's a fine suit of golden plate mail with expensive red cloth complete with a golden leaved crown. You could technically purchase the magic armour really early on in the game, except Link physically can't hold enough rupees to buy it. It's sold in the Fine Goods and Fancy Trinkets Emporium, a high-end store run by Chudley, who tries to flog the armour for 400,000 rupees. Chudley's a posh geezer who won't even let you enter the store if you don't pay 10 rupees to have your shoes polished first. The cheapest item in his store, the arrows, still can't be bought by Link even with the largest wallet in the game, it costs one more rupee than he could ever carry. After helping Mallow buy out the fancy trinkets emporium though, the opulent shop becomes a colourful, happy store with awesome music. And Chudley, perhaps as a result of a mental breakdown at having an overgrown baby as his new boss, now dances around and has a horn on his head. But more importantly, he'll now sell you the magic armour for 598 rupees. This suit of armour works similarly to its Wind Waker counterpart, it runs on rupees. When worn, you'll still take knockback from enemies, but will take no damage at all, instead just losing rupees. But it's not quite as strong as its equivalent from the Great Sea. You'll lose rupees at a rate of 2 per second when the armour is worn, meaning you won't want to just stroll around while wearing it. Interestingly, the design of Twilight Princess's magic armour is incredibly similar to the armour worn by Princess Zelda in that game, almost as if it's designed as a counterpart. The gold shoulder plates, the waist design, as well as the crown, complete with small rupee-like gems, are similar on both of the outfits. In addition, the magic armour features a Hylian crest, as well as the Triforce, tying it to the royal family. The fact that it requires rupees to protect the wearer, as well as its opulent design, similarity to Zelda's armour and the crest, leads me to believe that the magic armour in this game was designed to be worn by a member of the royal family, perhaps a prince. A member of the royal family, after all, wouldn't have to worry about the amount of rupees that he spent while wearing it. A man belonging to the most powerful family in the kingdom could easily waste hundreds of thousands of rupees while wearing the suit of armour if it meant that he was protected from all damage. 
Twilight Princess's magic armor is a shining gold when the wearer has rupees to power it, but if they run out, it will turn a very dark blue and wear the bearer down heavily. Gold is often the highest value rupee seen in a Zelda game. In every game that features them, they're the most expensive and sought after variant of the currency gemstone, usually worth the equivalent of 300 gold rupees. At the other end of the spectrum, the lowest value rupee ever in the Zelda series is the Rupor, a rupee which is actually worth negative. The Rupor is usually primarily black, with either a green, purple or dark blue tinged to it. Perhaps gold is the true, refined form of the rupee, and the magic armor is powered by this pure rupee energy. Then, when all rupees have been expended by the wearer, the armor becomes this dark blue in color, similar to a rupee, when all the magic from the rupees has been used up. So, we've got two different sets of armor. A magic spell sealed within a crystal, the family heirloom of Zunari, and the opulent golden armor found in Castletown in Twilight Princess, both providing complete, flawless defense at the cost of rupees. It seems that the magic armor found in Twilight Princess is a man-made suit of armor, designed to harness the magical properties of rupees to protect the wearer, while the armor from the Wind Waker is the real deal, true great fairy magic. Twilight Princess's armor is inferior, an imperfect design that constantly drains rupee from the wearer like a wine glass with a hole in the bottom. This is due to its man-made nature. It's been built by a Hylian to defend the rich, not the ethereal magic of a great fairy. It's a knockoff. Perhaps the sacred magic armor was once in the possession of the royal family before Twilight Princess or something similar was, and this armor is simply an attempt to replicate it. Previously on the channel, I've looked at great fairies and their origins. Across the Zelda games, there are usually just three main variants of fairies. First, the small fairy sprites, the fairies found in pots or near fairy fountains that Link can use to heal himself or capture in a bottle. Secondly, the great fairies. These could be considered the elite of the fairy species, found in great fairy fountains. They appear to be the leaders of their species, able to command fairy sprites to heal Link, as well as bestow their magic upon him, such as upgrading his equipment or gift him items such as Nehru's love. But even these powerful beings aren't the highest class of fairy we've seen yet. That honor belongs to the fairy queens. Fairy queens have appeared across a few Zelda games, namely Link's Awakening, Oracle of Ages, A Link to the Past, The Wind Waker, and Four Swords Adventures. These queens are just as powerful as they are rare. They're the leaders of their species and can command even great fairies to do their bidding. While there are a few different fairy queens, the most notable are the queens found in the Wind Waker and Four Swords Adventures. In Four Swords Adventures, a fairy queen is found in Hyrule Castle, where she's captured and torn in two. When the Lynx heal her, she'll show a glimpse of her true power, annihilating scores of soldiers and a powerful energy barrier with ease, and commanding the great fairies across Hyrule to aid the heroes. And in The Wind Waker, she shares the same design, a weird childlike being who upgrades Link's arrows to the fire and ice arrows. She's found inside the larger of the Mother and Child Isles, a great hollow island with high rock walls containing a secret fairy fountain. The fairy queen looks very young, with a small puppet of a great fairy with which she grants Link the arrows. This fairy queen is notable for the fact that she looks remarkably like Fee, the spirit of the Master Sword, who was created years before Skyward Sword by the goddess Hylia in order to serve her chosen hero. This design choice is really weird. In Hyrule Historia, we can see that it was intentional to design Fee like the Queen of Fairies, but why? Well, Fee was created as a spirit designed to serve the hero. What if the Fairy Queen, and by extension all fairies in the Zelda series, were too? What if the goddess Hylia created fairies simply to serve Link and his reincarnations? This would explain why fairies willingly give their lives for Link when he's in need of healing, and why Goddess Walls and Skyward Sword can produce fairies from nothing. They're creations of the goddess Hylia. When talking to Link in the Wind Waker, the Queen of Fairies calls Link just her type. While it's just a joke that causes Link to blush, what if she means a little bit more? 
that her type is the goddess's heroes, the heroes that the fairies were created to serve. The queen of fairies having a great fairy as a puppet shows her dominance over them, that she's in control. But interestingly, when she disappears, she falls down like a puppet with cut strings, and the music that plays here in the fountain features mechanical, toy-like sounds. This could be suggesting that the queen herself is a puppet too, perhaps hinting that she was just a puppet of the goddess Hylia, the real power behind her magic. So coming back to the magic armour, in both games it's been featured in, this armour is absolutely the most powerful armour. If Link has the rupees to power it, this magic armour will protect him from any and all damage. In the Wind Waker, it's in the form of a spell, sealed in a crystal, a physical manifestation of the power of great fairies. And in Twilight Princess, an imperfect, man-made suit of armour, designed for a Hylian royal prince, harnessing the magic power of rupees to protect the wearer. In the Wind Waker, Link can use the magic armour, fueled by the innate magic power of rupees, to cloak himself in the power of the great fairies, creations of the goddess Hylia, to protect him from any damage. Just like great fairies, when his rupees run dry, so does the magic of the armour, but when he's got rupees to power it, he's shrouded in divine, sacred magic, which even Ganondorf, the king of evil, cannot touch. Then, in Twilight Princess, we have an imperfect replica of the sacred item, a suit designed for the richest men in the kingdom, the princes of the royal family, which attempts to recapture the power of the original, but leaks rupees. So what do you guys think? Are my guesses on the origins of the magic armors right? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. As always, thanks so much for watching, and thank you so much for the support recently, it's just been insane. Cheers guys, and I'll see you next time.